I'm Joanne Gallagher, your Think Future podcast host. This week, Jody Bricou, an international circular economy leader at Oricon, joins the conversation to talk about the principles of circular design and how they are applied to water circularity in the built environment. This podcast is brought to you by Arcons, a global leader pioneering solutions and services to the AEC and manufacturing industries to support digital transformation for the built environment and smart manufacturing. Visit Arcons.net to learn more about how Arcons are helping organizations design, build and solve through digitalization. From Arcons to you, welcome to our Think Future podcast series. Each week, we'll share conversations with industry leaders from around the world to find out how they're thinking future. Subscribe to Archon's Think Future for access to more episodes, interviews, and profiles. Jody Bricou is the Circular Economy Leader at International Design, Engineering, and Advisory Company, Oricon. She's a globally recognized sustainability leader with two decades of experience working with industry, research, and policymakers in several countries, including Australia, New Zealand, France, and Dubai. Jody is also an adjunct senior lecturer with the University of Adelaide, a Circular Australia board member, and a member of CRC Advisory Committee of Industry, Innovation, and Science Australia, and the Victorian Government's Circular Economy Innovation Advisory Committee. Jody has been instrumental in building the principles of circular economy into the undergraduate curriculum and links the school with industry. Welcome to the program, Jody. Hi, Joanne. So great to be here. It's great to have you. Let's jump right in. So you are an expert for circular economy for over 20 years now. Could you please share some of the highlights of that journey? Yeah, well, I um, am known for being quite passionate about the circular economy. I trained as an environmental engineer, so I was always very interested in how to develop solutions to environmental challenges that the world's facing, but really thinking about how it links into our economic system as well. And I did an, a number of years of work, and when I came across the circular economy as a concept, when I was working in Europe and it really became a big thing around um, 2012, 2013, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation was putting out a lot of amazing work and business cases and evidence bases around why the circular economy model could kind of dig us out of some of this mess and actually present opportunities for the business first time. And they were articulating it really clearly as well. So this big complex systems thinking crazy mess of how do we connect all the dots, they managed to whittle it down to three key principles. So the first is we need to design out waste rather than trading at the end of pipe. The second is keeping stuff at its highest possible value. So how do you keep stuff lasting longer and keep it recirculating in our economy? And thirdly is how do we regenerate nature? So it was amazing doing this this work in Europe where everyone was on it and governments and businesses were working together and there was a real collaboration um, buzz around it really and running a lot of European projects and then being involved in the Ellen MacArthur Foundation as well. And then I came back to Australia in 2016 thinking, okay, so circular economy, that was great in Europe. There's so much manufacturing, there's so much going on. They can really make decisions. I'll just go back to Australia and hang out with the koalas and everything will be fine. And it turned out that Australia was really needing a push in this direction as well. So when I came home, very few people knew what circular economy was. They understood waste a little bit, but even not so much. So when the uh, China National Sword crisis hit and all of a sudden we weren't able to send our waste away. There was this massive wave of understanding um, in at scale what the waste problem is in Australia and that led to understanding our materials challenges as well. So it's been amazing coming home and bringing all the learnings and practices from Europe and working with different um, governments and not-for-profits around getting more uh, collaboration and understanding around circular economy in Australia. And now it's amazing because I'm a board member of Circular Australia. I'm on a Victorian government advisory committee. I'm on a federal government committee that um, helps allocate research funds. And circular economy is really front and centre of the national debate uh, here in Australia as well. So what does designing for a circular economy mean and what does it involve? 
it's quite tricky when, when we think about this circular economy and what it looks like where waste is designed out and everything's flowing perfectly and everything lasts long and everything can be repaired. And then we come back to, okay, my washing machine just went on a blink and I can't actually get a spare part for it and it's cheaper for me to buy the cheap one you realize that we're really in a major transition space. So there's a lot of people working on what do we do now? So what are what are the waste products that we need to to transform now? And you see companies and social enterprises really working on that. How do we fix the problems that are happening now? But the designing in circular economy is actually how do we want our economy to run in the future? So in the built environment, how are we going to build spaces and infrastructure that are made so that they can be maintained, so that they can be reconfigured if something happens in the future? So designing in circular economy for me is really thinking about how do we want this system to behave in the future and how do we future proof it for this climate and resource constrained world. So even when we might not have solutions for a product to be reused in the future or recycled in the future, can we still actually think about what it's made of, make it simpler, make it disassemblable so that maybe in 20 years when it's coming to end of life, someone could just jump in there and grab it right out, even though we're not quite sure what the solution looks like today. So when I'm thinking about designing for circularity, I love really thinking about that future-proofing aspect. We don't know, we're not certain about what's going to happen, but how can we be really thoughtful and intentional about everything that we're putting into our infrastructure or economic project so that that circularity is built in from go? Exactly, it makes a lot of sense. And we would need to have some way to sort of do a stock take of what's there and where it is so we can get it around the world in an easy, you know, low-carbon way. So if we knew where everything was, and you can do that through coding, I'm sure. Yeah, and that stock taking piece is really interesting because it's amazing working with with business, how little we know about the materials and the products and things that we're using. So when you go into a lot of businesses, you're like, all right, what materials are you using? How much plastic are you using? What, what are your five key materials that you need to be improving? And many don't know and they feel really embarrassed about that but it's so stock standard so not only do we not know what we're using now because we're not really tracking it but we don't know what it is in the future so that we can treat our stuff our infrastructure and our our things as as banks of the future so we're we're actually producing a lot of really valuable materials out there and we're putting them in these these objects and this infrastructure that's going to be around for a certain number of time. How can we treat that like a bank and actually think about how can we get those materials and those values out in the future as well? So that sort of data and tracking of materials, even understanding what we're using now so that we can get some priorities around what we improve and then having that data available in the future so that we can actually start to upscale and do some really funky things around uh, maintaining, extending lifespan, reusing things, and then recycling stuff. We, it's really hard to do that when we don't actually know what's out there. So when it comes to the guidelines for the built environment, do you have any principles that are um, sort of overarching across all industries? Yeah, absolutely. So principles are articulated slightly differently where you are in the world. Like you might be able to find some circular economy guidelines that are really relevant for where you are. But they basically break down that hierarchy of how do we design for the future? So there's always elements around using less materials, for example, using longer lasting and more durable materials. And that's really interesting because those two things can actually be intention sometimes, right? If you're wanting to use less and using sort of lightweighting things, but you're wanting to make things last longer, sometimes you actually have to to pick your strategy on that. So you're wanting to use less materials. You might be wanting to make things either last longer or be more um, flexible that you can pack up, pack down. So do you need this thing to be lasting a long time? And what elements do you need to be lasting a long time? Is there structural things that need to be lasting super long? But then actually within that structure, you have things that are designed for less time, but that you can move them around. And then you follow that right through to the end of life of the building or infrastructure and the parts. And what are you going to be doing with that in the future? So how are you designing it to be disassembled? How are you selecting products that can be remanufactured, reused in the future? 
So if you think across that whole sort of life cycle of the product and how you can be improving things across that, but then there's sort of cross-cutting elements as well. So business models. So if we really want to look at products that can be maintained and remanufactured in the future, should we be uh, purchasing them or should we be leasing them? Like the lighting as a service model that's, you know, the classic one that everyone talks about in Schiphol Airport, then rather the airport than the airport owning the lights, they actually lease the lights. Well, they don't even lease them, they pay for their performance. So that means that those lights are automatically renewed, maintained in the most optimal fashion because it stays with suppliers. So business models like that can actually underpin the design elements also. Yes, and Interface came up with the first one of those leasing models with carpets. So they've been around 30 years and they describe the life cycle of the product. Can you go into what that means? Oh, life cycle. I love life cycle. Anyone that uh, knows about life cycle assessment, just you see the world in a completely different way. And it's this concept of understanding where our stuff comes from, how we're using it and where it's going and what all the impacts that has along the whole system. So if you think of a building material, for example, what, what are the mining or the processes around creating that material? Then you're putting it into place, then you're using it for a certain number of years, then it's coming to end of life and it might be maintained in different ways. So what are we actually, how are we interacting with that product or material across the entire life cycle? And what, um, this is going to sound awful, but what damage is that doing to the environment at every step? Because really understanding life cycle is about understanding that that damage aspect. So how is this consuming greenhouse gases? How is this um, impacting our water, the chemical uses, and how are they interacting with the environment? And I do like to be clear that it is about damage. You know, us humans, actually, we kind of do a lot of damage all the time. It's very depressing when you work in life cycle world. And circular economy with that focus on how do we regenerate nature as well, and how do we create value? So how can we put numbers around the impacts that we're having on the environment throughout that life cycle from cradle to grave? And where it gets complicated with the circular economy is it's not a nice, neat um, cradle to grave, but you know, how is that being reused again and remanufactured and then recycled? And how do we kind of calculate all that? But then how are we creating more value out of that system? Can we be having products that actually clean the air as they're sitting on our buildings and that that's actually helping ecosystems survive and things like that? So you would say a circular economy is a powerful lever for change out of all of the possible ways to approach sustainable development? Or are there other ways that it works together with, you know, other levers? There are many levers and many approaches to create change and different levers for, for different cases. What I like about circular economy is that it takes into account that that notion that we are doing damage to our ecosystems and we need to understand life cycle type data to be able to do anything, but it actually gives us something to, to stretch for as well. We can see what a good system should look like and then pick it apart and figure out how we get there. So there are many levers that need to be pulled to actually achieve circular economy or really achieve the outcomes that we want from circular economy. We want healthy ecosystems, we want um, thriving communities, uh, we want to not live in a burning planet um, that is decimated by climate change. So then you're pulling levers around policy and design and, and maintaining things. And, and that's what's really interesting as well, right? Because everyone, every professional has an enormous part to play in this, in their role. Um, and every individual does really um, in how they behave in their economic system as well. When you look at the global economy then and circular economy, do you see any contrast? Can you explain what's going on in different parts of the world, where we are? It depends in what aspect. So if you look at regulation and how policymakers can push change, um, Europe's light years in front. You know, when I was there, they were really going towards understanding rule books of how do we evaluate uh, environmental impact of products and goods and services and how do we communicate that to consumers and how do we kind of put up those um, the scientific rigor so that this kind of information can be trusted. That was a really important piece of work that the European Commission and its organisations did. And now that's moving through to real policy with teeth. Um, 
So the first kind of eco circular economy action plans that came out of Europe, pretty soft, pretty waste focused. And now we're getting really, really deep into the traceability of materials and and the, the recent work around greenwashing and, uh, you know, really biting hard on that we are not allowed to make environmental claims that aren't uh, considered and can't be backed up is a really big one. And also asking for more or requiring more traceability along supply chains. So we want to know that these goods that we're buying in Europe are socially and environmentally just and fair, and you can't just make stuff up either. So that kind of approach on regulation in Europe is above and beyond. And also their incredible focus on the design aspect as well. So it's not just waste management, you know, figuring things out at the end. It's really how do we shift the system? So regulation, they are so above and beyond. In terms of innovation and business innovation, though, I find it fascinating that wherever you scratch, you see businesses jumping into the niches. They can see waste around them. And I mean waste in a broader sense. Where where are things not circulating? Where are things not being used? What's What are things or spaces or objects or technologies that they can tap into to create value from? And in Australia, we see an enormous amount of business innovation in the circular economy sphere. We've seen it notably in the agricultural industry here. Our farmers are well known for um, being hearty innovators in Australia. They, they figure stuff out and they don't like to waste um, and they see something lying on the ground and they really want to figure out how to do something with it. And so there's a lot of innovations that come from us in the agricultural space. Also, I'd like to say the water space because we're so water constrained in Australia. So our water utilities here are really up against it in terms of providing safe and long-term water provision for communities and businesses. And so we have to innovate a lot more in Australia. We have to think about how to pull all the value we can out of water. So you see some really interesting innovations there as well. So while we are playing catch up on regulations, things are really shifting now. Um, I think in terms of the business innovation sphere, we do some really great stuff. Um, everyone's on the journey, but you know, if you were to take the, the lowest common denominator, being an engineer or in the manufacturing sense that serves all of these industries, do you see large shifts going on there? Yeah, absolutely. And the ones that move quickest are the ones where an, an organization or a major stakeholder has more scope to play because the more complex the system it is, the harder it is to shift. So that's why we see a lot of kind of circular case studies. Exciting circular case studies that you read about tend to be in the product zone. It tends to be the IKEAs that are making um, funky furniture that's demodularized and things like this, or um, you know, jeans that are designed to be repaired and reused and recycled. And that's because you've got a big uh, retailer or manufacturer that can actually pretty much control the supply chain. They need to that it's still super innovative, don't get me wrong, and they need to work with different kinds of suppliers and they're, you know, breaking grounds on how to do reverse logistics and then getting people to relate to their goods differently. So they're still having to really shift the norm. But that's kind of the first pointy end because they do have more control than, say, go to construction and actually designing infrastructure. It's extremely regulated. You've got quite complex supply chains. You know, if you look at construction supply chains, you've got all sorts of different size companies with different abilities to actually implement things. So we see in the uh, design and construct area quite frequently that the first design that might have great circular economy aspects integrated in it, into it, a lot of that gets either valued, engineered out as you're going forward, that the exciting, fun, sustainable circular stuff you know, as things are having to drop off the apple cart, they kind of drop off. And then when it comes to actually implementing it effectively, you need really good tradespeople and really good skills and technologies to be able to actually build things slightly differently or use different materials or different techniques as well. So all along that value chain, there are so many spots where things can fall down. So it's harder for the construction industry and the engineering trades to actually shift this, but that's why I'm so excited about working for Oricon because if we are going to make big impact, we absolutely need to shift our infrastructure. And it's so complex. It relates to 
how we behave and move as citizens and how we design our cities and and going through to you know we're in the middle of a energy revolution we're we're shifting on mass to renewables there is so much investment in this space but how are we making sure that that re- renewable energy is designed with whole life cycles in mind otherwise we're already seeing it pop up the all the solar panels that have not been designed to be recycled and you know the recycling infrastructure is scrambling to catch up to figure out what to do with all these things now we are about to build or in the process of building so much new energy infrastructure we have to make sure that the maintenance and the end of life is taken into account now well this brings me to the the rationale for a good business case right that's your another part of your job or your how do you work with clients in that space develop the business case so they get the check so business cases are really at the heart of any kind of impact right so we need to be crystal clear in the, as advocates of the circular economy why this is worth doing and if we ever try to just say because the planet needs it um it's not really going to work so we work really hard to articulate that that business case in an engaging and evidence-based way and we weave in the economics the social and the environmental of that i just said you know we won't do it for the planet but that said a lot of companies have very clear criteria and where they want to get to on getting to net zero pathways and biodiversity and and um, zero waste goals and things like that. So we definitely link in all those elements as well. But the business cases really need to be around savings made, value created, um, impact on stakeholders, things like that. So generally what we see with circular economy models that do stack up now Sometimes the value needs to be articulated in a slightly different way. A, a key challenge we have is because circular economy models tend to involve more stakeholders. So it's not just one company, it's one company plus its suppliers, plus the people that are using the goods, plus the people that are going to reuse those goods at the end. And they're all involved in this beautiful, intricate system. But that means that they're all sharing the benefits of the system. So it's really interesting just looking at that looking at the system going, all right, where are those benefits? And are they financial? Do they express themselves in dollar terms? Do they express themselves in benefits around our stakeholders? Are they going to allow us to operate here more because we're doing something great? So the business case tends to not be simple and different for different projects and actors. But when we really think about it in that systems thinking lens, it's fascinating how much stuff you can get. So just one example that we've been looking at recently, the sin of hospital and trying to streamline, sort of designing out some waste and plastic use, right? So imagine a hospital with 800 trays of meals uh, four times a day, I think they go out, and the sandwiches are wrapped in plastic. So they're industrial sandwiches wrapped in plastic, So anyway, hundreds of sandwiches go back wrapped in plastic and there is no way that hospital can open that plastic to put the sandwich and the compost and the plastic the other way, right? So they're just looking at it and they're horrified and they can't see anyway. We had to look at the system and how everyone interacts with those damn sandwiches to figure out the best way to do it. But the business case was really clear (laughs) straight away. And then there's other ones that are more complex that you have to figure out how to make everything work before it stacks up. We'll be back to the conversation in just a minute. In the meantime, here's a little more about Arcons. Arcons has a mission to advance the efficiency, quality and profitability of project outcomes for its customers by providing best-in-class technology and services. Are you looking for a digitalization and sustainability-focused partner to help you achieve your goals? Join the thousands of AEC and manufacturing customers globally who have turned to Arcons to start their journey toward a better built environment and smarter manufacturing. With more than 50 locations around the world, Arcons can connect you to the right technologies and expertise so you can improve your competitive position and increase profitability. Arcons has an industry expert to help you navigate the best pathway forward wherever you are on your digitalization and sustainability journey. Visit arcons.net to find out more. If someone wanted to come with um, a challenge then, how do they get a hold of you or your your team? What do they do? Oh, okay. Just give us a call. Um, but it's exciting. So 
There's our team in, in Oricon and we work across all sorts of different types of infrastructure. We also work for, for governments, councils, um, and we, we are really passionate. You know, we're engineers, we're problem solvers, we're strategists, and we work in that messy middle zone. So we try to figure out how we can set the right strategy and metrics. So you might be looking at a certain material issue. You might be looking at behavior change. You might be looking at engaging executives and you really need to sort of kick around some ideas and contact some different people and start having live conversations about it. What's interesting as well about being at Oricon is that, and this is why we've got this dedicated circular economy unit at Oricon as well, right? So we have um, engineers and um, other types of consultants working hand in hand with a lot of big players in our economy. So I encourage everyone to talk about everyone to everyone about circular economy that you should be asking your accountants what they're doing about it you should be asking your strategic consultants about what you should be doing about it as well push them all so this goes back to the cost of good and bad design and the participatory approach to design where you include the stakeholders like at a hospital if you're designing a crosswalk for um, people that are aging maybe you should include older people in the design of these things at the beginning that's right. And when we're talking to people that work in like integrated design or good design or whatever you want to call like good, good, good designers, this is what they do. Like, how do I understand the system? How do I intervene? What are the problem points? And it's been lovely coming back in. So I was trained as an engineer and then I've just worked in all these, you know, wacky places since. And coming back to an engineering based firm, you sit down with engineers and you explain this stuff to them and they're like, oh, that's the kind of work I want to be doing and I can't get it across the line and sometimes I struggle to articulate it and justify it as well. So, you know, good engineers want to be looking at the whole problem and proposing something that works and that's future-proof. We don't want to see our buildings knocked down because they're, they're dysfunctional as well. So it's that investment in good design as well that's so important in understanding, but it has to have payback at some point as well, right? How do you um, juggle that push-pull between, yeah, we want the best building possible, but actually we don't have the budget for it. So how do you how do you leverage that and how do you identify the clever points in the beginning? And quite often we'll workshop with design teams. We, we did one recently for this amazing building in Melbourne, actually. And, you know, we go through, you know, what do you want out of the session at the beginning? And a couple of them said, oh, I want to know what we've done wrong. Why have we missed the boat that we haven't been able to integrate all this great stuff? And I'm like, okay, we'll see if we've missed the boat. And we actually came up with some really good tangible things that they can still do. And they walked out of the workshop and went, oh, my God, I thought our hands were tied. And they're not. But because they're not, there's no, we're all so busy. (laughs) There's not much space to actually you know, tie together all the dots and figure out the clever things that we can do that are in those interface points and get them and get them done. So you mentioned earlier, Jody, about water circularity. How about um, we talk about design principles in the context of conserving water in the built environment? What do you think about that? Well, whenever we're working on a circular economy project, we almost start with um, a mass balance of different materials, right? So what's flowing in? What's it doing? Where's it going? And when you think about water, it's exactly the same. It's a resource. Um, it takes different forms and different values. So, you know, some water is really high value. It's clean. Um, it can be used as potable water. And it's interesting to dig for what the value in that water is, right? So we kind of map out what water's coming in and the nutrients in that water is a really interesting uh, space as well. And that was, sort of overlaps with the whole food waste kind of agricultural system as well but so what what is coming in how is it being used how is it kept being kept at its highest value so exactly the same circular economy principles as we use you know looking at plastic or bricks or whatever so take water look at it like a resource where's it coming in how are we keeping it at its highest value and with those nutrients as well right because water and then water treatment and getting the nutrients out of the water you know, they can be a waste and a pain in the butt, or we can try to do something where we're making them a value and creating a co-product out of the water as well. So it's exactly the same approach when we were looking at a water system as we look at for any other kind of system. 
So, you know, the Holy Grail, for example, is potable water recycling that we've been talking about for 20, 30 years. And we're going to see it um, emerge. That's really the biggest uh, constraints and barriers to that is around um, social perception. You know, no one wants to drink recycled water yet, but it's shifting. Um, We've learned how to recycle water onto municipal areas really well and reuse different types of water from, you know, stormwater. So, you know, a lot of this is encompassed in water sensitive urban design. You know, it's very, it's very similar approaches, right? So anyone doing water sensitive urban design will go, duh, that's what I do every day. Well, yeah, it's totally circular. It totally fits under circular economy. Um, But, you know, it's right down to thinking about how, you know, desalination, you've got uh, wastewater with lots of um, magnesium and carbonates in it. How can you get that back? And there's an amazing um, startup that's working in South Australia. They're they're based in, in London and and Sydney and whatnot, but they started doing pilots in South Australia with SA Water, they're called Hydrophists, and they're taking that desalinization brine, which is a massive problem um, around the world. What are we going to do with this desalinization brine? And they're transforming the problem into a really valuable resource that can be used um, in agriculture, in construction. So at every part of the water system, there's awesome things that we can be doing. And the Eco Village Network, they've been recycling water and grey water and black water in residential areas for 40 years or more. Are you drawing anything from that movement or is it just purely in the industrial sense? No, absolutely, absolutely. That that water use in our homes and how do we reuse and, and also decrease the amount of water that we need. So all the traditional... Everything around integrated water management and reducing water loads and reusing water that absolutely fits into the circular mindset. So whether whether water professionals are calling it circular or not, you know, you take a look at any water utility and a lot of what they're doing is circular already. So how do we look at it really intentionally and ramp it up? So all of those eco-village type uh, aspects that people have been testing for I don't know, 20, 30, 40 years. Um, I know when I was at uni, I was visiting eco-villages that were doing great stuff around water. And that's where it's really about that social acceptance question, isn't it, with water, that uh, why hasn't that scaled yet, though? Is it is it because it's not easy for the consumer? And I love trying to pick out, like, what can we do to help that scale? And an example, for example, one client I worked with when they were looking at trying to reduce the use of water, and a lot of water utilities have done this, it's not super unique, but it's going beyond what they'd usually do and buy buy the consumer's low water um, pressure shower heads, for example. It's not traditionally a water utility's role to go buy shower heads for for their folk, but actually by doing that, it really makes it easier for the householder to reduce water. So if we shift that over to water reuse, how can a water utility help householders access the technology or or the security and the peace of mind that you might need to do that as well? So we're always looking for new ways. So even though my team works more with the industrial side, or but we also work with policymakers and things like that, we're looking for how I kind of feel like we we live in this this economic world you know we pay our bills to the water utility we buy electricity you know it's it's big business that makes everything move and run um they should be actually supplying us really great solutions to help us do better and that it's not always the onus on the individual to be you know working so 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 hard to be sustainable i just really want it to be easy and mainstream and i think working with big industry is is the way to make it mainstream because I would love people not to know that they're being circular. It's just how the house is set up. And that's where I, I love going to, there's this great technology, there's a technical solution out there. Why isn't it being taken up? Is it, you know, what are all those barriers and how do we work together as a system to lift it and make it happen? And, the you know, that business case we were talking about that's so essential to that, we need to actually demonstrate really tangibly uh, and metrics is a really good, important aspect of that as well. We we actually have to demonstrate and provide an evidence base to understanding how to move forward. So, Jody, that's very interesting about water circulation in the built environment. So what are the challenges you're seeing with water circularity apart from perception in the built environment? So there's several because if not, it, it would be done already. 
There are technical challenges to how we can treat and bring water back to the highest value and how much that costs really. So the cost of treatment to actually achieve potable reuse, we need to get to the stage where that water is actually super, super needed for it to stack up. We will need to actually treat the water more. And that's causing tensions as well because we're seeing with the increase in desalinization that's required to sustain our communities that comes at a huge cost in terms of, of energy use, which is which is price. It costs a lot to make desalinized water as well. So all the there's the, the technical aspect of it and the that economic aspect that is very closely linked to the technical we maybe we can see how to do it technically but we can't afford it we can't afford it yet so teasing away those very tangible aspects of it are very important for any kind of technology or system that can increase the circularity of our water systems the other one that i wanted to touch on of course is is regulation so very stringent regulations are in place to keep us safe um, around water that it's extremely um, important and I would not like to be operating in an economy where those regulations aren't in place and that we can't be sure of the safety of our water but there can be sort of unintended consequences of certain regulations as well so where it's limiting us from from reusing things is really important and, and innovating in this space as well. So what we're finding, for example, is that water corporations are such an exciting space for potential circular innovation. They are place-based, so they're really fixed in an area. They interact with all of the community and all of the businesses in the area, and they actually manage this system of resources in a place-based area, right? So they can have, you know, I think more than any other type of business, they can really impact the circularity of the area or the zone that they're operating in. They are set up not to do that. They're set up to provide safe drinking water at reasonable prices to communities. That is, at least in Australia, that's what they're set up for. You know, they're they've got all their targets in place and they're linked to the government and it's very important that they are focused on that primary goal, safe water, reasonable prices to our um, customers. But then, so there's all these opportunities though. So while they're treating the water, they've got all these extra co-products that could be made. They've got biogas, so they've got energy. That example that I talked to you about before with the desalinization, that they can actually be creating new resources from resources that are in this water. So much innovation they can be doing but they're actually not set up to do that. They're not set up as a regular business is set up. So they're frequently quite hamstringed in what they're allowed to do. And it's a bit scary to experiment with, with water because it's so important as well. So thinking through that regulation, not only in terms of what we can or can't reuse, when does something become a waste, when is it not a waste, but actually how some of our government agencies like Water Corps are set up and how we can enable them to innovate and bring to fruition circular economy solutions is a really interesting point for me. And can they work together with industry and digitalization or other tools? How would you see that happening? So it's amazing working with people in the innovation space in water industries because there's such an amazing um, room to grow and to innovate and potential. And they're doing amazing things. And I know they've got a lot of the water organizations in Australia have great innovation teams that are really testing things out and pushing the limits in terms of even methodology. How do you measure things? How do you explain things? But I always feel a bit sorry for them that they're not in a space that's easy to innovate, I think. And so that that's something that a lot of organizations are working on. And even so we're working for a group of organize, of water organizations in uh, Victoria. So Vic Water is set up to group, uh, you know, a number of different water boards, and they're doing some exceptional work around uptake of recycled material in water infrastructure. So they're actually pooling their resources and working together to understand how they can push it forward, uh, you know, creating really great tools that they'll all be able to use. So there's a lot of really amazing examples out there of how water corps are collaborating together and also how they're collaborating with businesses in their local region. There's, there's more than I could possibly name. So there are sort of levers for change inside the water system. Is there anything they could do in the existing 
infrastructure to make changes, like start small to go big, sort of start me- measuring what they're using, for example? So yeah, it's a great question on how, where, where do we start to improve water circularity? And sometimes we can completely design things from scratch. Sometimes we have to work with what we've got. Uh, so in any circular economy uh, conundrum, uh, measurement's really important. We never have all the data we want though. So you need to sort of increase measurement and in water measuring, and in anything actually, measuring the amount, but measuring the value is so important. So in materials, we always talk about the value and we can talk about that in terms of carbon emissions, in terms of how much it costs, in terms of its recyclability. In water, um, the value can be around its chemical values as well, the nutrient value, the cost and all these kind of things. So not just, I really focus on this, not just measuring how much, but actually cutting it down into the different value and the different parts. Uh, So even just starting by measuring and figuring out where where your losses are how do you reduce all that so your your straight up basic reducing water consumption is an essential part of the circular economy because it's designing out waste right a, a water that's um water that's lost that in like flush systems that are using too much and um and other things that are using too much water or leaking that's your basic straight up first strategy of design out waste so even if you're not designing a new building or if you're rehabilitating how can you have a look at some of those technologies to design out um, water loss in the system um, based on data and metrics some of it you might not need you know basically where your water's going you know there's toilets in the in this facility so we know that that's really big and the kitchens and you know sometimes we know it sometimes we don't need to actually go into the nitty-gritty but you know, more data, the better, uh, and work through that. And then have a look at the innovations that are around um, at a building level, for example, that are interesting ways to treat water and keep it running longer in your space, really. But um, nothing better than the drop of water that we don't use in the first place. So whatever happens, whatever funky reuse system you have, using less is always the first place to start. Great. Thanks for explaining that. And the value can be seen and unseen, you know, like externalities, they call it. KPMG talks about ex- externalities. So there are some things that are positive and negative or seen and unseen, you know. So it's all of that you're trying to look at the value of water. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, and and it's really interesting looking at externalities and how they relate to things like biodiversity, which is such an important topic that we haven't really touched on today. But water links into biodiversity a lot. And how how can we measure that? It's very much external to our um, balance books right now. But there's a lot of people working on that through natural capital and other techniques to actually try to bring in that valuing of biodiversity into the core. So we're approaching the end of the interview soon, but I just wanted to mention to the audience that there is a guidance from the World Green Building Council on water circularity that came out at the end of last year, and you probably contributed to it, Jody. But can you give a few examples of good case studies, at least one good example of a case study that people could maybe research, look up? There is one I wanted to talk about that's a bit of, I like finding the kind of unexpected and weird case studies. And I, I had to dig around and we've done this great project um, recently. One of my team members was involved um, as part of this kind of integrated design push for for uh, Oricon as well. But we work um, closely. We're a, a partner under the capital delivery program of our local um, water authority that's called SA Water. So I live in South Australia. SA Water is the water authority. And this is really unusual because... Uh, SA Water and Oricon saw this potential to use water in a really exciting new way in quite a regional community and actually did a study together to figure out how that would work and pitched it to the state government and it's now being implemented. So even that notion of how that collaborative uh, way this project came about, I think is really interesting. So this project's at uh, Port Perry. And we implemented, we designed a greening Port Perry strategy. So Port Perry, if you don't know it, is a super hot, uh, remote um, kind of regional community. It's 220 kilometers from where I am in Adelaide. Um, and then it's basically like desert and mines as you push forth. There's about 14,000 people live there and it's mostly known for its lead smelter. So um, take of that what you will, but we're talking about a pretty hot, dusty community community. Um, that's an absolute lifeblood for our state 
uh, with a lead smelter. So it's not known as like the most amazing place to go and live, work and play, right? So we looked at integrated water management solutions so that that kind of whole of system lens on it of how we could use water to actually support greening Port Perry and the outcomes that could come of that as well. So there was a lot of focus on livability and health and using water sensitive urban design techniques and also climate resilient species selection. So we haven't talked a lot about climate resilience, but that links into this so, so much. Um, I think it comes through when we talk about future proofing, right? We're, we're, we're walking to a very rocky future. So they've used these water sensitive urban design and climate resilience techniques to actually come up with a whole strategy for the town to actually use a lot of passive subsurface irrigation, which basically pulls all the rainfall down to the root zone, helps irrigate trees, so creating more green space that's much healthier space, uh, reducing the volume of stormwater leaving the streetscape as well, because where the stormwater was going before was going to a place where it becomes salinized and you can't use it after as well. So actually thinking through how the water moves in the community was really uh, important and when these imp in initiatives are implemented so the community health aspect is really about abating lead-borne dust so there's been a lot of design around how can we use vegetation and trees to abate that dust so that's that actually uh, regenerating nature aspect as well so it's really creating value in the space but there's also uh, a lot of interesting social links there around they've really thought about how you know it's, it's a hot place right so people don't walk a lot so how can we green and create spaces where people walk and then you improve social interactions as well? There's a lot of social challenges in the community and improve that physical and mental well-being. So going from the use of water um, in you know a not sort of piped system, actually thinking through how that water can be used for a lot of really interesting outcomes in this city that this well, this community that desperately desperately needs it. Um, but you know it's a water authority and a consulting engineering group that have looked at it and gone, oh, there's something not right there. I'm sure we can do that better and actually pitch this amazing plan to the government that's now getting financed and going in. Wow, that's awesome. Water for life for everyone. Cool, huh? <laughs> that's wonderful. Um, final question. When you think future, but all the opportunities just have given this amazing story, what excites you the most then? What excites me the most is every time I interact with people, thinking about the impact that they're going to have because this is systems change. So I'm not excited about one technology or one part of the system, but actually we all have a part to play. And so I'm, I'm just thrilled. There's so many people that I meet or that listen to a podcast like this, right? They'll contact me five years later and go, oh, I listen to this podcast. And then since then I've changed my job or, you know, I've done this thing and you're like, heck that was like actual ripple effect of impact so so that's what excites me is that this involves all of us and that it's very solutions based and we can all actually do something it gets rather depressing trying to save the world but very exciting thinking about the role that we can all play well it's just so wonderful that you know you're a global strategist for water and for cir circular economy in general and you're living here in australia so we're very happy to have you so thank you very much for being on the show sharing all of your knowledge take care Thanks so much, Joanne. This podcast was brought to you by Arcons. Arcons is leading the digital transformation of the AEC and manufacturing industries by providing best-in-class technology solutions from world-leading partners and their own in-house development software from the Arcons B Smart portfolio for building, infrastructure, and manufacturing. Arcons is a company that cares about creating and building a better world. Together, we are working with industry and environmental experts, providing firms and platforms through our Archons Think community to create conversations that matter to our future generations. We invite you to join in the conversation and participate in our Think community. So like and subscribe to Think Future to stay up to date with the latest innovations and conversations as we advance the digital journey for AEC and manufacturing around the world. You can download our podcast at ourcons.net or from your favorite podcast platform. From Our Cons Think Future, thanks for listening.